uh, laptop because that makes it look like you're looking to the side or you can talk to me okay. either way. Oh, excuse me, we are live. I am sorry. <laughs> Welcome to Trail Talk, everyone. Uh, I'm Edie and we are live at the Chisholm Trail Heritage Center here in Duncan, Oklahoma. We're in our classroom studio at kind of a, it's kind of our go-to spot these days. We're kind of like in this room. And I wanna introduce you to our very special guest, guest and longtime friend of the Heritage Center, Wallace Moore. Wallace, um, you know, I've only ever seen Wallace um, wearing clothes that look like they're from another time period. <laughs> I'm, guess, I'm guessing you've got a uh, regular updated apparel somewhere, Wallace. I've got a sweatsuit. He's got a sweatsuit. <laughs> That's really funny. So the reason he wears these um, time, kind of a time from a certain time, clothing from a certain time, is because you are a historical interpreter. Would that be a good, or a storyteller? But I'm trying to read his face now. <laughs> several, several titles. Several, uh, titles. several titles, okay. Um, my, um, I started off with, with simple, simply with cowboy poetry. Cowboy poetry, okay. Um, and then it kind of morphed in. I've been volunteering with the museum uh, for the film. That's my involvement with the Buffalo Soldiers. And I was volunteering in the museum, and uh, so my, that piqued my interest in Buffalo Soldiers. And then from there, I um, I also began to get interested in, in uh, Roman and Mm-hmm. So the thing kind of spread. The idea of telling a story is um, not a, not a new one. It's still just as difficult today as it was back then. Mm -hmm. The first problem you have is maintaining your audience's attention. The average uh, person, adults are better than children, but children, that's where I manage because I talk to mm -hmm. adult, more, more children than adults. Right. I can hold your attention for about six, seven, eight minutes. Mm -hmm. And after that, your mind starts to drift because you have so many other things that, that I'm competing with. And at that time, I have to get active in, like the sandwich place says, I have to refresh. Uh, what we have to do is uh, transition um, to another subject. Or another, if, I've got, if I'm on a main subject and I've got, sub, uh, I've got um, some uh, subtitles that I'm talking about, I've got to transition to them and keep you involved. Now, the, the idea is, if you ask me to tell a story about on any particular subject, today I'm dressed as a as a deputy marshal. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that's that's what you asked for. Okay. And this is how I would, I would appear: badge, gun, the whole business, like like you would expect in the 1880s, 70s, a deputy marshal to be dressed. Mm -hmm. The reason for this is I have to ignite, uh, turn on that little TV screen on the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. And to do this, um, I'm black. And we haven't been indoctrinated uh, by the, the media, so to speak, to see many black deputy marshals. Mm -hmm. So now I've got to give you an idea of what one looks like. So that uh, when I start to talk, and sometimes if I'm talking about something you haven't heard about, you know, then I may have to paint the scene. I may have to, I may have to set the background and start to, start to talk. And um, I've been fairly successful at this for all my life. Um, just since I've retired, I've been, Marsha and I've been doing it uh, uh, professionally. We have an organization called Barking Water Productions, where- um, say, say that again? Barking Water Barking Productions. Barking Waters. Mm -hmm. Or water or waters? Water. water. Barking water, water productions. productions. We'll, we'll include that in the comments okay. on the uh, um, Some years ago, <clears throat> God, it's probably 20, 20, 20, 25 years ago, I was primarily doing and writing comic poetry. And I got invited uh, to a poetry festival in Oklahoma City at, uh, at the Cabo mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that came to my attention didn't bother me, 
Uh, but came to an attention real quick about kind of what poetry is. Um, I was the only black guy there. Um, and while I was at that, that day at the Capitol Hall of Fame, that was a stage set up where poets and musicians were coming on in, se in sessions all day long. I wasn't supposed to go until about three o'clock. And I was wandering around the museum and didn't have anything to do. And uh, there was a class being given um, by, uh, in, I, I promised I was going to remember this guy's name, but I can't. Um, but he, the class was on how to write and how to present a cover poetry. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh my God, I can learn something. Right, yeah. So I went to the class, and while we sat there in this little classroom, make sure classroom, he let everybody in the class um, give us a bit of your best point, your favorite. And when it came time for me, um, there were a couple of women, uh, but mostly white men. And so when it came to me, I got up and gave my, my point. Everybody seemed to like it. Um, and when the deaf said much about it, he didn't say much about it. Class was over. I got ready to leave, and he stopped me. And he said to me, uh, I, got, I got another point or two I want to share with you. I thought, oh my God, I really must have messed up. Yeah. He said, no, I liked it. He said, I really did. He said, but the problem with it is, I couldn't tell if I heard it on the radio, I heard it in some place I couldn't see you. I couldn't tell that you were black. And I, went, I started thinking, is that important? And before I could, I could comment, he said, the reason is, is 95% of the men and women that you will compete with in this field mm -hmm. are white people. 95% of them tell uh, Western stories about the old West about the history of the West that was made by white people. And nobody is talking about Blacks. Nobody's talking about Native Americans. And uh, he said, if you do use your skill and your talent to do that, then you will always have a reputation. Mm -hmm. So even though my books, uh, this book here, this is my first book, Ebony Shadows of the Trail, it's a uh, it's a book of short stories. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a bestseller, <laughs> but it is an interesting read, I think. Um, my second book was Ebony Horse Soldiers. Now, this one, uh, we've had a lot of success with it. When people ask me to tell stories about the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, we normally bring this book along and, and uh, we. The reason is because this is the only book of its kind hmm. in existence. Really? Well, yes, can I say that? Normally with you confidence. Say that, yeah, <laughs> with confidence. The reason is because, first of all, there are several books that have been written about the Buffalo Soldiers. Most are about the history of the Buffalo Soldiers, where they were, what they did, what time period, that sort of stuff. The rest of the stories are fictional. About mm. the Buffalo Soldiers. Mm -hmm. This is the only book of its kind that's written that describes the life and times of the Buffalo Soldiers in cowboy poetry before. Oh. So there are about 80 poems in here, they're all mine. And but when you read them, you if you read them casually, take your time and read them, you get a when you finish, you'll have a good, in my opinion, you'll have a good idea of who they were. Right. Um very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's, I that's love that. Year. This is the my, this came out this year. This mm -hmm. is my latest book, Hoofprints on the Canadian. Uh, it's probably, if I can, God will forgive me for, for being vain and bragging, but I think it's my best work. There are six short stories in here. What I've done with these two books, in telling the short stories and the short stories, I, I, these books are historical fiction. Okay. That is, I pick a, his, a, a fact in history, mm -hmm. and I'll I'll develop a character, and he'll be there. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't change. He doesn't allow to change things. The historical fact, actually, the incident took place, and, the, and you may or may not be able to ever prove that he was there or he didn't he, he didn't see his footprint, mm -hmm. but he was there. Hoofprints on the Canadian is an opportunity, and I started with this one with Ebony Shadows of Trail. It's an opportunity to show 
uh, black men and women as a normal. See, after the the uh, Emancipation Proclamation the Treaty of 1866, and the five civilized tribes had to release their slaves. Mm -hmm. These slaves did not make a mass as an exodus. Right. They stayed in eastern Oklahoma, and they they morphed into. You you could not. They don't look any different from anybody else until you go there and you visit with them, and you find out they are a bit different. Um, the, the descendants of slaves that still live there today mm -hmm. are ninety percent of the, of, the, of America's black horsemen, black cowboys, come from Eastern Oklahoma. A um, few from Texas, but Eastern Oklahoma, Muskogee, Okwelgee, Tulsa mm -hmm. produces ninety nine percent of them. And I'm not talking about just someone who owns a horse. I'm talking about rodeo performers, right. uh, the black rodeo circus dealer. Now these men are the descendants of of these of these uh, men and women who were slaves of the five civilized tribes. They have different. They have, they have different interests. And different. They were molded differently. Now what happened with me is is once I started the research with the help of um, of um, um, a couple of Serious historians, one, Mr. Uh, Tawana Spivey, who lives here in Duncan. Mm -hmm. And I started working with the museums. Uh, Mr. Spivey and I didn't hit it off right off. He's, he's a very complex man. Mm -hmm. And most geniuses are. He just, they just they don't want to. I mean, this, the guy knows how to do so many things. It's so good. It scares you. It's, it's almost like magic. But the thing that got my attention about him was that he, he, was, he, he knew just about everything. That wants to know about the Southwest, in particular this part of the country, about natives, and blacks, outlaws, lone outlaws. And I worked as a volunteer. He didn't pay me, mm -hmm. not in cash, but he knew that I was a sucker for uh Wallace, I need you to do something. Oh, by the way, I mean, did you know about so and so and so and so? Mm -hmm. right now? now I my cowboy poetry, you know, you can't for my cowboy poetry was not part of the sheets. I wasn't, I was. I did get a, an opportunity to perform with Michael Martin Murphy out okay. at uh, out Medicine Park. Uh -huh. And while we were there, um, at, during that period of time, I was working with Good Deal Time Rubber Company, and I had horses. And um, Marsha and her husband had a ranch out in Faxton. So I was keeping the horses there. And when I would, I would go to gathering, Performance. She'd be around. I'd be feeding it. She, what you been doing? I tell her. And she asked, "What is this cowboy poetry doing?" She's a retired school teacher. Which, actually, she hadn't retired at the time. She was going to retire. And I told her a little bit about it because it's different than regular poetry. Right. The cowboy poetry things rhyme. Regular poetry things. And have a very distinct yeah, yeah, meter yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. them. Yes. You can you yes. can just go. Probably. Yeah. Well, I I showed her some of my work, and when she read it. Instead of saying, wow, this is either good or bad, she started reading it. She said, you don't, you don't even spell that. <laughs> um, Everybody needs one of those people in their yes, lives. Yes, I didn't know that. I in the past. <laughs> when I was uh, dealing with Michael Martin Murphy, um, he came to the Museum of the Great Plains in Lawton and he made a speech and a talk. He had recently been involved in a TV program uh, about Lonesome Dove. That was his, one of his songs. Oh, right, right. Very, yeah. very sad. The Western song that he had, Two Doves. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I went to his, his session listening, and there was a question and answer period afterwards. And of course, after, if you wanted to answer a question, I'd love to raise my hand. And he said, Can I help him? I said, Yeah. I asked him if he was going to do any more. So any more other TV appearances like those with them. And uh, he told me that those were his plans. And then he said, I have a question for you. Uh, um, he said, who are you? And I said, I am America's only black cowboy poet. Well, the audience thought that's cute. Mm -hmm. All the people said, I'm just trying to right. laugh. They, they thought that's cute. He didn't laugh. He was kneeling down on stage looking at him. He didn't laugh. Uh -huh. And finally he said, I believe you. 
He said, I have uh, produced and put on uh, numerous uh, Western shows. I've had, uh, I've had black uh, entertainers on my show, but mostly they're musicians or they work behind the scenes. I've never had a cowboy point. And he said, I'm going to be at Medicine Park tomorrow night. Would you open for me and do some of your points? So his, his manager, her hair caught on fire. She was on the back of the room. She came running down, no, Michael, no, don't make him any promises. We can't keep it. We don't have a contract with this guy. We don't, we don't right. know who he is. Right. Uh, yeah. We already have somebody. So he didn't back down. He said, I tell you what, come to my show and you'll, you'll, get, you'll get on stage. So I did. And the end, end result is there was an opening act. He, he and his band performed. Everyone was pleased with him. Then they took a break. And then he did, he threw me a bone. He said, we just met, but he, he didn't tell the audience such. He said, my old friend, what was for, is here. And he's America's only black cowboy poet. And people like, who is this guy, what was for? So I walked up on stage, took the microphone, and I did four poems. I was well received. And uh, I went and sat down. And then after the show was over with, uh, I was talking to a few people about it. And, and uh, he sent his manager to get me. They were on stage. And I went back and he said to me, uh, who do we make the check out to? Well, I didn't know I was going to get paid. Mm -hmm. Nobody told me this. You, you, you do this. You know, so I just said, well, he said, should we make it out to your manager? And of course, I was like, you know, the cat with his foot in the milk bowl. <laughs> uh, yeah. So he said, you don't have a manager, do you? I said, no. He said, let me ask you another question. He said, those poems that you recited on stage, he said, are they copy? Do you have copyright? And once again, my mouth fell open. He said, let me tell you something. He said, more than likely, you will record it. He said, if you don't start copywriting your work, mm -hmm. you're going to be on your way to work one morning at the grocery store. And if you listen to Country and Western Station, you're going to hear one of your poems with music. Mm -hmm. Put to song. Put to song. Mm -hmm. He said, number one, start getting it copyright. He said, get somebody to help you. And I thought, wow, okay. So they gave me this check. I couldn't believe it. I didn't cash it for the longest because I, I was short. Sure <laughs> So I went home and I, I've been married now. I'll be married this June, um, 56 years. Oh my goodness. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Took a rat right from there and the rib right out of there. There you go. So I went to my wife and I said, honey, I need a manager. I need a roadie. I need someone to run interference for me. Right. And she said, not on your chinny chin chin. <laughs> well, I got to thinking about it. Who can I trust? Who is this nosy? To be a good researcher and a good storyteller, you have to be nosy. Right. And so my best friend, Marsha, Marsha Pebble, I asked her, and she jumped on it. Oh, yeah. And so we've been doing it for about 30 years. Wow. We've, uh, God has blessed us. We've been to Disney. We worked for Disney for a week. Uh, we've been, we worked for the Cowboy Hall of Fame for, for about five years, five, six years. Uh, she's helped her with these books. And what she does is her job, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the stories here. Sure. Her job is to keep me out of rabbit holes. And so whenever <laughs> I speak in public, she gets in the back of the room where I can see her. Uh -huh. Because I don't, I don't work from cue cards. Oh, All of right. this, that is it. Right. And uh, as I'm talking, uh, I, she'll start to give me this. That means you got five minutes left. Mm -hmm. And then it's time to turn into the wind, put the flaps, lower the flaps, and put the wheels down. <laughs> and then she'll say, that's enough. Because sometimes the client has said, okay, we want you to talk 30 minutes. Right. And schools, the bell was ringing. Kids got to go catch the bus, go wait. Um, the other thing that she's been a, a world of uh, value to me is when I, I talk, I advertise the book mm -hmm. that represents the genre that I'm, I'm, that I'm covering. And if, for example, if I'm talking about the Buffalo Soldiers, I'll have these books. She'll have them in the back of the room. And I'll tell the audience that, of course, they can buy this book from me. They can get it from Amazon or they can get it from, you know, the clearinghouses. Right. And, but you can get an autograph copy from me at the same price. And then uh, she handles the money, she handles the, she gets, gets them all lined up, and then she starts waiting. 
and threatening me and I have to come back and sign it. Now, here where it gets kind of sad. Yeah. When I return, let's assume that we've made some money and money is not an issue for the time. Take, I don't want to spread around, but I enjoy doing what I do and that's the reason I do it. God has already blessed me with a living. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm retired. Right. So if I make some money, great. And if I do, then I have to share. I have to pay her because mm -hmm. she's worked. And then I have to give my wife some peace money. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have peace and quiet now. It's worked for 50, mm -hmm. almost 50, 56 years. I You've know. got a good yeah. thing going there. I, if I make $1,000, I could say maybe just $200 is half what I got here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and, uh, um, and the rest goes into my regalia, my right clothing yeah um weapons um I, the weapons that i wear are, are historically correct um from mr spivey i learned about historical correctness mm -hmm. which gave me an insight with museums museums you know, don't you come there and be a presenter and miss educate the public so um that got us kind of started and we decided that um Storytelling was probably a little better than cowboy poetry. It is nearly as dry. And um, so I have a Facebook, uh, Facebook and of course a website. Mm -hmm. The website is oklahomastoryteller.com. Mm -hmm. Now on the website uh, are the areas that I work, I try to stay in. I'll, I'll talk to, I can talk to you about Drovers, that is the man who came up the Chisholm Trail. Right. The black the black cowboys. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the lawman. Mm -hmm. um, Bass Reeves, that much. Yeah, yeah. The outlaws, Cherokee Bill, and that much. Um we've added um I am a I'm a Mus Muskogee Creek citizen. And so we had, we've added a little bit of history now um, about the history of the uh, black Seminoles. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I had a program here for the right, right, yeah. Black Seminoles and Creek free, Freedmen. Um, and we'll, we'll design a, um, a story for you. Now, we work for Mrs. Jackson uh, up in Chickasha, the uh, Strawson Society there for the last few years. And she normally, it's normally uh, like it was when I was in high school. We'll, we'll pick a word out of the hat, and that's what you're going to talk about the most. Ah. Uh, with her though, it's been um, um, it's been pretty easy. My most difficult, and I try to stay in this area. My most difficult character was Paul Sykes. Now you must remember this guy. Uh, nobody already knows about Paul Sykes. Mm -hmm. uh, I I go to a, I'm a I, I'm, I'm a believer. I go to an evangelical church. Right. And Paul Sykes was a modern day prophet. Okay. Very few people have heard him. Uh -huh. the, the town of Kingfisher got in touch with the first event. See, the way you get in touch with me is you have to deal with my agent, you have to deal with Marshall. Right. And by the way, she's very easy to deal with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's so, very so, nice. So <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to let her say anything ornery about her. <laughs> we want you to come up here and tell the story of Paul Sykes. So I asked Marsha, who is that? Was he a cowboy? Was he a lawman? She said, no, he was a black preacher. I said, oh, I don't do preachers. And I don't know if like, oh. See, I learned there are a couple of rules. Right. If you, if, first thing, if you want your audience to stay in tune with you, I've learned uh, don't say nothing bad about Martin Luther King, Elvis Presley, but Jesus. Be wrong. Well, yeah. here, Paul Sykes, <laughs> Paul Sykes is a preacher. In an all white town, a black preacher in an all white town. So, is there a story there? And these people were excited. They said, We'll pay you and Marshall to drive up here, pay mileage, to drive right. up here for me. And um, I went and, and I talked to them, and they, they laid out all the information. Just review this information, learn about this guy, and be him. I kept turning them down, but and I, I shouldn't go into detail about how much money they offered us, but it was. It was enough where even when I give Marsha her share and my wife her share, I was still, you still I was still pretty well off for it. You know, <laughs> spent this thing three ways and I'm still at the end. So we did. 
And we found out that uh, it wasn't that hard to do. That Paul Sykes, uh, around the turn of the century, when Oklahoma was becoming a state, mm -hmm. King Fisher was one of the towns that was in the running to become the state capital. Mm -hmm. It had a train station. Train. The way you got there was by train because the roads were so bad right. during that uh, time period. Few people had automobiles, but they, most everybody did by train. God, according to research, uh, found this man in Mississippi. He was a sharecropper. And didn't, an angel came to him and gave him scant information him, get up and go west and feed my children. And Paul Sykes did that. He left his family, left everybody, started hoboing west, stopped, took him several months. He didn't know where he was going. One day he's, he knew when he got to Kingfisher, Oklahoma, this is what God wants him to be. Well, there wasn't a large black community. It's never been. Right. And uh, are there any like of the black towns no, around no, there? No. <laughs> no. Wow. No. There were, blacks tended to be in places where there were. Um, that was labor for them, like right in the cotton industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, that part of the country is wheat. So there weren't there weren't, there weren't that many black uh, black farm owners. F few black people at all. When he arrived, nobody knew what he was going to do, and God didn't tell him what he was going to do. Now this is when I, if I could make this story up, it's, it's sort of like COVID. Right. Nobody believed you. You made that up. <laughs> this man went to the train station. The train stopped. There were two spots. One, when the train stopped, the colored people, black people got off here, the white people got off here. Mm -hmm. He went down to where the white people got off. And he pulled his hat off. And when they would get off the train, he would sing and pray. That's what God told him to do. Well, everybody said, you don't get your head beat in. Those cops are going to come and beat you up. It's not going to work. And for about 30 years, that's what he did. It got, he got to be so famous. He was so beloved. Some salesmen would come to Kingfisher to sell farm implements. They wouldn't, they wouldn't go into a business unless they were black. They were blessed by the old black preacher at the, at the train station. It got to the point where the pastors began to complain about when I wanted to hear him sing his song and he isn't. And the train left. And so the train said, listen, we can't, we can't make the stop any longer. So what we'll do is we'll kidnap him and take him up to Chicago and give him a little station there and he can. And right. let him preach all he wants to up there. Right. He said, Nope, this is what God told him to do. Well, after I did all, and these were newspaper clippings, most of them, mm -hmm. that these people had collected pictures of him mm -hmm. around the turn of the century. And so I had to dress like him. They found his one of his granddaughters in a nursing home in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. There weren't enough black people in Kingfisher for us to have a festival. <laughs> so they imported yeah. some black people from Oklahoma City. Uh, they, they found a couple of black churches in Oklahoma City. Said, "Listen, we got this program. Right. Said, ah, okay, we'll come down." Let me tell you how this thing got started. I don't want to I'm chase the rabbit here. But <laughs> Listen, I, I'm following you. Okay. I am the worst. I go down rabbit holes all the time. <laughs> I'm standing off stage, ready to go on it, and I'm going. I'm going to become Paul Sykes. Paul Sykes. As a joke, because his name is Paul, someone started calling him the Apostle Paul Sykes. And so if you look him up and you Google him, you uh -huh. can Google him right and Google Kingfisher. And when you take Google Kingfisher Oklahoma without the Apostle Paul Sykes coming up. Really? So I didn't know that. Yeah. Well. I'm, 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 I'm an okay. So I'm standing off stage ready to go on. And they're trying to set the atmosphere. And they're going to sing the, the Negro spiritual weight in the water. You know, weight in the water. So I thought some of the black people that, that they had imported from Oklahoma City would do it. Right. They brought in a little farm girl, all knees and neck. And uh, she was too big. Brought her up on stage and I said, what? And I figured, well, she'll do the best she can. The child started to sing a cappella and Ella Fitzgerald crawled out of her. You hear me? Uh, the, the audience, people were crying on their feet. Oh and, my goodness. So the audience was right for me when I went Set the stage. Set the stage. And later on, I got a chance to meet his. Now that meet his uh, his granddaughter, and that was um, probably one of my uh, most uh, uh, rememberable moments as a reenactor mm -hmm. and a storyteller when mm -hmm. I got a chance to tell his story. Well, it was a it was kind of a 
a step out of your comfort oh, yes. zone. Oh, a long ways out. You know, and, <laughs> yeah. and so I, I can see where that would, you know, you, well, the, the, you, couldn't, you couldn't pull on your usual Here's what we do. Thing. What I do is, if I'm asked to tell a story in advance, you give me a couple of days, the kind of research that she'll do for me, she'll tell me all the intricate details, like this is how old he was, this is where he was born, so many times he was married, significant others were. I try to see things as he or she would have seen it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from their point of view. And then when I go on stage, I become that person. And it's easier to tell his story or her story if, you, uh, if you're telling it from their point of view. Mm -hmm. For example, I noticed you have a picture of um, Henry Flipper. Mm -hmm. I'm often asked about Henry Flipper. Oh, really? Um, and I, I'm careful about what I say about him because probably one of the most um, unpopular African-American politicians today is Clarence Thomas. If Henry Flipper had been alive, he would have been a follower of Clarence Thomas. He would have been a Republican. Uh. Uh, re that's something research reveals. It research mm -hmm. his, with his line of thinking. Right. He was. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it's, it's helped educate me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't take a stand on, on politics and I don't take a stand publicly on, on, on religious matters or anything like, like that. But I will not change history. And my one concern is that I tell the stories of Indians soldiers fighting, struggles with outlaws, lawmen, et cetera. I don't have many Native American followers. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time keeping them in my uh, in my audience. And it's partially because they, they've been burnt so many times than by other storytellers. When I tell a story that deals with the history of Native Americans, I tell it the way I researched it. Right. Some years ago, about 15 years ago, I was asked to go up and Northern Oklahoma to a little small town to talk to a group of ladies at a convention uh, for war mothers. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what a war mother was. I, I drove up there, it took me a long, a long time driving there by myself. They, so we want to hear about the Buffalo soldiers in, in Fort Sill, the Indians, and that's what they wanted to hear. So I said, okay. Well, I got there and this was, was any, like any other sorority, but it's all women. Mm -hmm. To be a war mother, you had to have a, a child that had been killed in combat. Well, I got up on stage, introduced me. I was well received. I started telling my Buffalo Soldier stories. I have four or five that I tell. Mm -hmm. And I started mixing some up that deals with Native Americans. And there is a story that should be a movie. It's about the Battle of Anadarko. Um, nobody's made it yet. Mm -hmm. Marsh and I did our research. We went out to the site uh, out uh, east, of, east of the town of Anadarko where the Wichita agency was. Mm -hmm. In 1874, there was a two-day battle that took place there between um, Kiowa, Comanche, uh, probably some Arapaho, um, and the 10th Cavalry that was stationed at Fort Sill, Buffalo soldiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I told that story. The, the object of the story is that cooler heads need to prevail when there is a, a conflict on the horizon. Right. That dialogue is better than combat. And the Battle of Anadarko, everybody lost. Mm -hmm. The Indians lost, the soldiers lost. We had a big fight mm -hmm. and nothing was resolved. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, one of the, uh, the stars of that fight is a Comanche war chief called Big Red Food. That's his name. Big Red Food. Food? Mm -hmm. Okay. Meaning primarily, um, I'll be your. I'll be your, you can eat me up if you want mm. to, I'll be your big red food. Mm -hmm. Well, he'd been out on the state plains with Warner, with Warner Park, and he came into the agency looking for rations, and he still had, he wouldn't give his weapons up, and the agent panicked, he said, Fort Sill got the Buffalo soldiers, they came, that was a big fight. When I finish the, the story, normally there is, and forgive me for sounding vain, but I normally get a pretty good applause. Right. This time, stark. Silence. Nobody has said a word. 
So I stood there for a few seconds looking around and said, well, maybe my pants are unzipped. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> there's some, gotta be something, something is wrong out. here. Something is wrong. And uh, they all sit there looking at me. And finally, the little lady, who happened to be Native American in the front row, got up and started to applaud. And when she did, the house erupted. So later on, I was, uh, oh, this banquet was different from any other banquet I've ever been to. They had good food. <laughs> These old ladies can burn. I mean, yeah, yeah. When they ask me, would you like to take a plate? I'm normally modest and say, no. I said, yes. <laughs> take, one my wife, take one for my wife, too. <laughs> and while we were doing this, one of the uh, ladies came over to me and said, do you know who she was? I said, she is a descendant of Redford. And so the crowd began to think, wait to see if she's. Uh... So I never, I, if, I, um, if I make a mistake about someone in history, um, I'm careful about that. Um, you're an ancestor, you're a relative. If I'm talking about uh, Deadwood Dick, if I'm talking about uh, Cherokee Bill, mm -hmm. Cherokee Bill was, a, was an outlaw. Uh, so he was a psychopath, he killed a lot of people. That was one side of the story. The other side, he was a Robin Hood. Was good looking and uh, women, you know, huge female following. Uh, got hung by Judge Parker when he was about 20 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, interest, real interesting story. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, he has a family. And if you're telling that story in eastern Oklahoma, probably some of his, you know, around tells us some, some of his relatives still live there. Mm -hmm. They're still descended from the Cherokee Bill. So you have to make sure that you, you tell it. History has to be told the way you find it. Right. You don't have a right to alter it. I don't have a right to, because I don't particularly like uh, little white ladies with almost gray hair, so I'll make your glass half empty. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk about that. Right. No, no, because I'm pretty, pretty proud to find a view, I make a glass empty. Just tell it the way you find it. And let go of the exercise. And, and you know, uh, I've, I've, I've do the his, historical interpretation characters here at the Heritage Center. So I, I know, I kind of know a little bit about what you're talking about where um, it's not always, it, it's not always a pretty story. No. <laughs> or, or there are, you know, there are parts of the story that you mentioned earlier before we were live, where you might choose to leave something out depending on the age of your audience, yes, yes. you know, make it age appropriate, things like that. But there are just, uh, history is messy, messy, very messy and, and not always easy to, um, to talk about. Yes. But if you can tell it as a story or a, a poem or something, it's not that it makes it easier to swallow, but it's easier to listen to. You know what I mean? Yes, Don't you think? Exactly. I agree. People are easier to deal with when you when you give them lyrics. Right. I didn't. I didn't <laughs> you know, it's sort of like when you you, you, mean, you you swing something in front of a cat, you'll watch it. Well, if it rhymes, mm -hmm. see, music rhymes. Mm -hmm. People pay attention to it. Now, I'm a country country and western fan. Mm -hmm. I predominantly like the old stuff, and the reason is because I was born in the 20th century, but the people who raised me were programmed in the 19th century. And uh, so for a long time, my primary entertainment after supper was my grandfather would tell me a story. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I learned, I learned how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, but the, the storytelling and storytelling evolved with me from that point on. Right. Um, living in East Oklahoma, naturally it was about cowboys, it was about horses, mm -hmm. it was about Congressman uh, Bell Star. Sure. Uh, then, then after I got, I started working with Mr. Spivey, he introduced me to a black author uh, named Art Burton. Art Burton. Burton. Now, Art is uh, from um, Oklahoma, um, but he spent his a lot of time in Chicago. Okay. And he's a, he was a college college professor there, and uh, he he's written several books. And that's when it became, I became aware that of the fact 
the African American, African Americans, 99% of all of the books that I do research for in, so I can tell the Buffalo's older stories, the stories about the best, mm -hmm. my white, white men. Blacks and Native Americans have not written, did not write their own history. And Art, Art is just one of those few people. Now, what he writes about, he's, and he's the one that helped me get started with him. I follow some long. Right. Um, Tawana told me, said, you need to read one of his books it's called Black, Dead, and Redly, uh, uh, Black, uh, Red, and Deadly. Well, I read the book, and there's a chapter about my great great grandfather in the book. Really? Yes. And of course, that opened another door. Right. There's and, another rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, another there. rabbit hole I got <laughs> chased down. And it appears that my great great grandfather, uh, the man I was named for, the man that my grandmother named me for, uh -huh. was one of the deputy United States Marshals that, that worked for Parker in Metropolitan. Uh, he was three quarters of Creek, born black. And uh, so that's why I did my, my Native American heritage from his side of the family. Right. But I was not that aware of it until I bumped into to Art and he told me, yeah, this is Daddy Candy, yes, my friend. And uh, I got stung through my stuff. And my grandmother left me a picture of him. I have a picture of him. And since then, uh, uh, we've expounded him quite a bit. I've written a couple of poems about him. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Grandpa Wallace killed a, um, a famous Creek outlaw named Wesley Barnett. Uh, that's how, you know, like that Garrett, that famous for killing Billy the Kid. Well, right. my great great grandfather got, got famous for killing. Uh, Wesley Barnett, who was a quick, uh, who was a Billy kid of the Creek Nation at that particular time, um, mm -hmm. did some other things real interesting, and um, it, it Marsha got hooked, line the sinker. And for a while, I had her. Uh, we were shooting single act. We were doing single action shooting. Uh, we were on the sass, mm -hmm. and her character was Billy the Kid's sister. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Billy the Kid had a sister or not. They didn't know she. Uh, but she she became Catherine Bonnie, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we traveled around and burned up some ammo. Uh, <laughs> spent some time, and any chance I get, if I'm with her, we can't pass a cemetery. Um, there's some real interesting cemeteries up near around Rust Springs, places like that. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you know. I'd love to go through cemeteries. <laughs> my husband and I went, we traveled to Vermont for mm -hmm. our honeymoon. We went through cemeteries yes. in Vermont. I mean, sure. I think cemeteries are so interesting. It's Well, the cemeteries, for example, Fort Sill, uh -huh. there is an unbelievable amount of Native American and Buffalo soldier history at Fort Sill. It's probably the best kept secret why because it's a it is a active military base uh for a while but sometimes civilians are a little shy about going out there there are three very good museums the indian war museum is probably one of the best of its kind um uh, as far as the artifacts are concerned mm -hmm. um, there are things in the museum that, that um, for example the gun belt and knife and belt that geronimo was wearing when he finally surrendered in Mexico, mm -hmm. they have on display. Uh -huh. Now, uh, the problem with Fort Sill is, is that nobody tells their story. Um, they don't, I don't know if they, how, how comfortable they'd be, but loads of tourists showing up. But in their music, in the cemetery, Fort Sill Cemetery, the military cemetery, are all of the stars of dead soldiers force. Really? Like the yes. The the yes. Yes. Indians that were the, being Indians portrayed? were played in dancing with wolves, Kelly Costner all buried in Fort Sill. What wow. happened? That, <laughs> what that happened is, is Tawana, Mr. Spivey, uh -huh. was a, is, is good friends with the man who wrote the screenplay, the book. Okay. okay. Well, he came to Fort Sill and talked to Tawana and Tawana educated him on who the cow and the Comanche were, uh, were and their prominent leaders and et cetera, et cetera. And so he sat down with Mr. Blake and wrote this screenplay. Then when it became, it was about to become a movie with Kevin Costner as a star, they couldn't make it in Oklahoma because the scene in the movie, they have to chase some buffalo because buffalo. Well, the buffalo we got here, you came for a rocket, buffalo. <laughs> they're, they're a little on the tame side. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
they wanted yeah. to, and they wanted to, they wanted to run and kill some buffalo as part of the movie. Uh -huh. So the whole thing got moved from Oklahoma to Montana. The people that they used as extras were actually were Indian Native Americans, but they were Crow. Mm -hmm. And the Crow were pretending to be the Sioux, Lakota. Mm -hmm. And they all had Comanche and Kiowa names. The, Oops. <laughs> the star in the movie, uh, the, the girl, the lady with red hair. And, uh -huh. It stands with the, the, clenched stands fist. With the, fist yes. uh -huh. the man in her, I think it was Kitty Speeds, the man with her, with her as a star, uh -huh. he kept asking her, who is this? And she kept explaining to Kevin Costner, his name is Kicking, Kicking Bird. Uh -huh. Kicking Bird is a cow with peace chief. He's buried in Fort Sill. Wow. Um, That's a great piece of trivia right there. <laughs> yeah, if you go, I, to you go to that cemetery, you can just... You can just walk through it, pay attention to what you're looking at. Anna Parker's there, his mm -hmm. mother's there, mm -hmm. his sister's there. And this is the last piece of trivia I'm going to leave with about Fort Sill. The first person to be buried in that cemetery was buried there in February 1869. Mm -hmm. There was nobody else there, it was just a piece of ground. Mm -hmm. His name is Jesse Bickle. And all the graves are marked as they put a new grave in, they mark a number. This is grave number one. Hmm. Jesse was black. Really? Now, the cemetery, the next time they had to bury some people, they just buried them there on that spot. And so Fort Sill is has a cemetery that goes back to the to the eight, to 1869 time period that was never segregated. Hmm. If you walk the top of this. The hill, my Marsha and I have on a couple of occasions. Matter of fact, we've our latest explorer, we, we got two of us stuck in a cemetery. <laughs> 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 I must get make those sharp turns. Oh, but yeah, anyway, yeah. If you walk across the top of that hill, we believe there are at least 24 Buffalo soldiers mixed in with the other people. So, was uh, the first Mr. Bickle, was he a Buffalo soldier? 10th Cavalry. Wow. Uh, but right next to him, on his grave is here, and on this side is Kicking Bird. He's buried here, and on this side there are two members of the Seventh Cavalry. Hmm. So, the, for whatever reason, Fort Sill. If you go to Fort Reno, all the blacks are buried here, hmm. the whites are buried here, and one little Chinese guy buried right in the middle. Well, <clears throat> go to oh, go to go to Fort. You go to Fort Sill. You have to look. If it says Tenth Cavalry. 24th Infantry, 9th Cavalry, or, 20, uh, or 25th Infantry, they're Black. Other than that, if it says anything else, they're not. Wow. And they're all mixed together. Um, it, the, the cemetery was integrated. The guardhouse was integrated. Huh. Um, the guardhouse, 1875. Right. If you got put in jail at Fort Sill, and you, and you happen to be white and you're fussy about being in jail with an Indian and a black guy, but not get put in jail at Fort Sill. <laughs> you better get in trouble somewhere so, else. Huh? Yeah, because this is all the cell space we got. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay. So I have a, a couple of questions that mm -hmm. have come to my mind. What, you said you grew up listening to country music, but what drew you to cowboy poetry to begin with? I mean, obviously, I'm saying obviously, I'm I'm guessing this. You didn't have a lot of friends who were involved nobody, in, nobody. in it. I mean, I so I'm I'm very curious what drew you to cowboy poetry. Okay. I had been doing it all my life. Okay. I just hadn't been able to put a handle on it. Uh -huh. I didn't know about anybody else was. Right. Okay. Um See, storytelling is just a matter of when I I I I try never to plagiarize. Never, sure, never. right. But I will study other successful authors. When I was a boy, it was Sam Gray. And one of my most prized possessions from a good friend is a first edition book of, of by Zen Gray called Riders of the Purple Sage. Mm. It sets the stage. Uh, when I was a boy, that's who the author was. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, junior high school, I I read, but I only read Zen Gray. Mm -hmm. I read the other stuff that I had to, 
and the history books. I read history books, but right. the rest I just got to ignore. That's a good idea, but that's what I mean. So when I had to write a book report, I wouldn't write it. I just make up the story, pick a date, turn it in. I don't get a call. Um, I've been doing this for years. I didn't plan on being in the army. But God had other plans for me. It was an accident. I wound up in the army uh, in the Oklahoma National Guard when I was 16. Mm -hmm. Then I wound up in the regular army and got out in 1990. But I never stopped being a cowboy at heart. Mm -hmm. You see, I believe you are now what you were then. I was programmed as a four or five year old child mm -hmm. in that that kind of stuff. Did you wear Western clothes all my life? Your whole life? Yes. I got teased about it quite a bit after I got to be an adult. Right. I, I can remember I can remember one of my most prized possessions was a cowboy hat my wife bought me from out of Bill, Oklahoma, from Grand Leaders, uh Grand Leaders uh, uh drive it out of a clothing store in out of Bell, and everybody laughed. Said, what did you give me for? What, 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 what's, that, what's that all about? A very expensive cowboy hat. Right. But she understood. Yeah. Um, in, she knew what she was yeah, carrying. In, 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 in Germany, in Germany, in the in the, um, in the, the bookstore, Stars and Strike bookstore, uh -huh. the other guys would be buying penthouse, in the stream. I'd buy Western Horseman. Huh. Uh, if I could find it. And um, it's always been there. And when I retired, I was blessed to retire with enough rank um, to Oh, so retired. you were career Oh, yes. Army. I, stayed, I stayed there for 27 years. Okay. Active duty 27 years, two and a half years in the National Guard. I retired as Sergeant Major. So when I retired, now I have time to, to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, I started to work at Goodyear. And I don't want to say anything bad about Goodyear because they were good to me. Sure. We, we traded even. But I worked on a machine that was so, so noisy. You were literally, people were all around you but you alone. Mm. You couldn't say boo to them unless they were standing right on top of it. If you couldn't, if I couldn't smell your breath, I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you could say whatever you want, as long as you smile. If your boss walked by and you want to tell him what you think about the smile, <laughs> he's good to you, Alice. He's good to go. To keep from going mad, because you have to stay at your machine. It's like, right. a, like, like being a galley slave. Right. I, in, I started memorizing comic poetry. That is, I would, what I do is memorize a line, mm -hmm. say it again, say it again, and I can place it in the back of my mind. Then I go to line two, mm -hmm. say it again, say it again. Then I regurgitate line one, add it to line two, say them both again. Mm -hmm. When I come home, I would come home and scribble them down before we forget them, because now I have a complete story in one confession in my, in my mind. And I know what to do with it until. I bumped into some folks that said, well, listen, you need to come out to Madison Park. There, uh, there's a cowboy poetry festival out there, and, and they had some cowboy poets meeting there in the, in the, in the little lounge that's in the front of the skating ring. It used to be a skating ring, now the auditorium. Mm -hmm. And there, and then somebody invited me to, maybe my mother invited me, and then it kind of caught on. From the rest, I learned the hard way. Um, I learned. Number one, if you're going to talk, if I'm talking about Buffalo soldiers, the client, Marsha, will make the deal. She, she most likely, but we, we now, we're professional, we're 501c. Right. Um, we have a contract. Mm -hmm. And she'll, she'll get that signed. She'll, and the contract will specify what I'm supposed to do and what, time, what I'm supposed to be dressed, et cetera, et cetera. And if I'm talking about Buffalo soldiers, then I may recite doing, she said, okay, how much time do I have? And she'll say, well, she got 45 minutes. In that 45 minute time, a poem lasts about seven minutes, eight minutes. Mm -hmm. So I got time for three poems and a little bit of grass in between. Mm -hmm. Opening remarks, question answer period, over. And what I do is I start off with a whole one crusher. That is, I start off by saying something that will shock you. Right. I want you to sit up and pay attention. Mm -hmm. And then I, when the poem is over, 
I can only hold your attention for about for about seven, eight minutes. Now I've got to either set myself on fire, strip make it, I got to do something <laughs> to get your attention again. Yeah. Yeah. And you all and, and the, 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 one of the tricks is look at your audience. I pick on women. If, if you and your husband are there, you have a very friendly face, I might chop you. Mm -hmm. If you're watching and paying attention, like that, that the young lady is there, she's watching. Mm -hmm. This is a problem. Mm -hmm. I use this to keep me on keep I don't. So when I go on stage, I may start talking and I'll start fooling with my pipe up with tobacco in it. Right. And I'm talking. And you're saying to me, is that idiot really going to light that pipe? You can't smoke in here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, about halfway through the program, things are beginning to people in a drift. Mm -hmm. I need to, that guy way in the back. He's beginning to look up the wall. I, I need his attention. And so I asked that lady in front of us, ma'am, excuse me. This is not the, the, my story. Uh -huh. Do you have a match? I don't know if you have a big purse kind of match. And she, because she's not a match. Who carries matches anymore? Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> she's looking, looking at her husband. And, Sounds like oh, you don't have a match. I, you know, I came up here out of light. I can't light my pipe. And by this time, that guy in the back is like, "What's he say? He wants to. He wants to light his pipe." Then I move you on. Get I don't attention. ever. I got yeah. your attention again. Yeah. It's called a whole hum crusher. A what? Whole hum crusher. Whole hum crusher. Mm, I like you, that way. <laughs> the other thing that I do sometimes is if I'm telling a story that you know nothing about. Uh -huh. I have to paint the picture. So I may start talking, for example. I'll, I'll tell you the story real quick to show them. Imagine, if you will, a little Indian lady, old, my God, gray headed, a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. She's sitting on the porch of her little shanty at the Spotted Tail Agency. Standing down in front of her is a young man, quite a, a dude. And he's a reporter. And he's got a pen and pencil. And he's ready to take down every word. And she's going to tell him a story. Now, I painted the picture. You can see her. You can see the little woman. You can see the little house. You see the guy. And now I don't tell you that the point has started. I just, I, I get into it. Mm -hmm. She's going to tell him a story. This is a story that the world has never heard. And then I become the little Indian woman. And I, I raise my voice and say, son, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story of my grandfather. It's one that I often tell. He was the only black man that rode with Custer at the Little Big Horn. He followed him all the way to hell. And I'll pause, I'll let them absorb that. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, anybody knows anything at all about Western so customs and people ask them, what are you talking about? Right. And she says, folks used to say to my granddaddy, Isaiah, how come you happen to ride and scout for old yellow hair? The man's got a death wish. He don't get everybody killed. Everybody knows that to be true. Grandma, you see, he would just smile and laugh. Grandma was a hunk mama Sue, one of Sitting Bull's band. And my grandfather was one of only two of Custer Scouts that could speak the language of the Sioux. Now I'll pause, I'll fool in the pipe, I'll get their attention, I'll let that soak in for a little bit because I don't want to rush them. Mm -hmm. I want them to see that picture. And then we'll move on and she says, my red brothers were balling for a fight. And our spiritual leader, the great sitting bull, cut a hundred pieces of flesh from his arm for the spirits. And he promised us that he was going to sing, pray. And under the leadership of war chiefs like Crazy Horse and Gaul, and with the help of a few repeating rifles, we were bound to rule the day. And then we have another pause where she gets sad and she says, they say that a thousand angels wept the day we fell. 
So can we fail? But now the battlefield is quiet at last. Sitting Bull was the only one who wasn't surprised by the victory. He knew what was going to happen. He had already seen it in a dream. To him, it was just legacy coming to pass. And now a little lady gets up, tightens her blanket up around her, her shoulders, and starts toward her door. And she looks back and she said, Son, I told you my story. That's all it is. Every word be true. I didn't have no lie to tell. My grandfather was Isaiah Bowman. He was the only black man that went through the Seventh Gallery and put me on stage with custom on the video. That's the story. Now, if I want the people to applaud, I need to say thank you. Sometimes they don't know what to do. That's mm -hmm. her job. Right. Yeah. When she's clapping twice, they light up. Yeah. Now I have time to get my thoughts together and transition to the next story. Mm -hmm. I would normally use that point if I was talking about the scouts, black scouts. Some of the most famous scouts in the West were, of course, like some of the scouts were black. But it shouldn't be any more than about seven minutes. And you should never tell a story or either a writer story, like either one of my, if you read one of these stories, you won't read this, I promise you, and race ahead in your mind and say, oh, I know how this is going to end. Because I always call for a fastball and go <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't think you're going to know. Don't think you're going to know how it's going to end. I got, I got you. And I, I, uh, I've, now, what I've learned, I didn't learn in journalism school or speech class, but I've, I've read a lot of, for example, I read a, I've read, read almost everything Blue and Lamar's ever written. I have great deal of respect for them, but I've learned that there are also mistakes that you can make. And one of them is you get caught up in what you're doing and you don't hear yourself. That's her job to say, hey, Wallace, then we use that, there's certain names I like, mm -hmm. certain yeah. towns I like. She doesn't, Use the same time your last story came. Oh my God, right. thank you. Right. So I'll change it around. Right. Or yeah. he had this kind of rifle when he rode into town. Now he said, This, where did he, where did he change guns at? Oh, thank you. Now, the, 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 everyone needs a Marsha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the problem is, is that you must like what you do. To bring this in, you must like what you do. And that's what's easy to do. We get paid sometimes quite well. Sometimes we don't. Right. Sometimes we'll, we'll go and we'll make expenses, hotel, hotel, hotel meals, and if she won't have a she won't eat a hamburger, so we got to buy real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if all that hotels, meals, and, and gas, but come on, yeah. and we have to pay for it also. Yeah. Sometimes there's a front for it. The problem is, is it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, I'm glad I'm leaving. Yeah. So what happens to me is I'm doing this. This is a hobby that pays. And so I'm free to do it. For example, one of the one of the, the best Garth Brook songs, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because I mean, is one that most people who follow Garth Brook know me about. And it's about cattle drive. And it didn't get it get very popular, very much played. Garth Brooks wanted it. And of course, Garth Brooks is rich enough. I've, I've got some of the hits. I'm making lots of money, so I can sing this. Mm -hmm. And he talks about he talks about the Chisholm Trail and the cattle drive. And, and, uh, you have to find that song. Yes, I'll, 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 I'll show you. Okay, do that. Yeah. Um, and he talks about um, um, crossing the rivers and cattle drive and stampedes and that sort of stuff. And nobody got hot and bothered about the song, but Wallace, I did. <laughs> now, the people that have influenced me, and I promise to tell you about this, and I won't get for long. Garrison Keeler. Maybe. The uh, radio. NPR. Radio, on NPR. Yes. NPR? Uh -huh. Marsha and I went to Oklahoma City to see Garrison Keeler. <clears throat> I think everybody else to go with me. Because everybody's going to go see Garrison Keeler. Who is that? Yeah. Is he like one of the Beatles? He played with him. Was he, was he in the band with the. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we got to Ford Center, and there he was on stage. He's just 
plain white bread. He had one kind of little brown suit. He didn't have his hair fixed or things special. Mm -hmm. But he's a genius. Mm -hmm. You know what? You know what he had on? Mm -hmm. You know what I call gotchas. I dress in a regalia, family regalia. Right. That's a gotcha. Right. Uh -huh. He had on some bright, bright red tennis shoes. It had nothing to do with the way he looked. Mm -hmm. It was just, and you guys are like, what's he doing in those shoes? What are these dressing? Right. Now he has my attention. Yeah, yeah. And he starts to tell me a story. He is a genius in the sense that Garrison Keeler um, invented in, his, in, the, in the recesses of his imagination, an entire town. And so every week at the end of his radio show, mm -hmm. he would read a fictitious letter that allegedly was written to him by one of his relatives in this town about what's been going on in the town. And he talked about various characters, about the minister, about the chief of police, about the town drunk, about the about the lady who wears a little too much makeup and, mm -hmm. and push her bra. And he talks about all of them. Mm -hmm. And people would listen to his show. And I'm, I'm, I've been deer hunting. Got out of my deer stand so I could, I could get back to my truck and catch, radio and catch, catch right. NPR. Right. Now, <clears throat> a man that can create and keep in his mind an entire town. And he did it so well that the um, tourism department in Minnesota. And they turned people away. They're, they're <laughs> they were looking to, for that they're town. They're trying to do Minnesota. Can, where's Lake Wobegon? Let me drive through there. <laughs> you can't go to Lake Wobegon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's in Garrison Keeler's head. That's genius. Uh, true. true. That, that guy, I learned, I copied as much from him as I possibly could. Uh -huh. Tom Hall. Good storyteller. Mm -hmm. Country and Western music is yeah. nothing more than stories. stories Most yeah. of them cowboy poems, but music. Uh, one, of, one of the about 20 years ago, there's a country and western song. Nobody got hot and bothered about it. It's a story. There's a young man who wants to play the guitar. He wants to be a star. He's walking, hitchhiking to Nashville. Mm -hmm. And as he's walking along, he's just outside of Nashville. You can see the city lights. Mm -hmm. And a Cadillac drives up stops big Cadillac. So he gets in. When he gets in, there's immediate smell of bourbon whiskey and smoke, cigarette smoke. And the driver's all his eyes look like he had slept about five years. And the driver's driving, going on towards Nash to Nashville with his kid. And he's he's, he's asked about what do you want to do? Well he says, I want to be a big star. And the driver starts to talk to him about what you have to do, the dues that you have to pay. And then the driver asks his son, can you make him cry? Can you play and sing? Have you paid your dues? Can you sing blues? Can you bend those guitar strings? That was somebody's point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was a story of a ghost, the ghost of Hank Williams picking this guy up. Oh, uh, okay. It's clever. Very clear, um, yeah. The best probably uh, was Jerry Clower. Mm. I know who that is. Jerry Clower invented a family. Mm -hmm. Let us. Mm -hmm. I had some friends that would let us, and they swore, "Yes, we can do." <laughs> no idiots. <laughs> Marcel led better. Only lives with Jerry Clark's Marcel led better. Oh my goodness! See? Yeah. And these are storytellers, uh -huh. and they managed to pull it off on the public. They begin, and, and of course, in, in their situation, they made they made some money. Um, these are the people that I learned from. You mix this with a little bit of history, uh, with help from, uh, from from somebody like Marsha. I do um, I do my research. I like she she does research. Mm -hmm. We do the research, and the thing that we, the story that we're looking for is one that says, "Have you ever heard of this? No, nobody's ever heard of it." Mm -hmm. But that happened. Mm -hmm. In closing, I'm going to tell you this: I am now writing a story. I've I, I weighed in with her about it, and she's going, I don't know. Which is? We woke up. We woke up. In 1907, the good citizens of Wilco lynched an outlaw. I know the outlaw's family. One of his, I worked at Goodyear with one of his, one of his great, great grandsons. Hmm. 
and the story is that the outlaw's daddy put a curse on the town of Hooper. As a result of, uh, because of, of the lynching? Because of the lynching. Hmm. Not that the outlaw didn't deserve to be, right. to be hung, right. but he should have been lynched. Yeah. The story tells the facts about where the lynching took place. Mm -hmm. I've been to buy that spot several times. When you turn it over and turn from her and my imagination loose with it, I travel back in time to 1907. I see that spot. I see those people. I see that building. I see that incident take place. Now, we can't identify any of the citizens that went mad and was involved in the lynching. But we do know that the outlaw's daddy was named. He was a black Seminole. His name was King Kajo. He put a curse on the book. He said, you will not prosper as a town. You will wither and die. And the last verse in my, in my poem will be a story about, we woke up, about this incident. Is if you go to we woke up today, you can't help but wonder why there's so many dilapidated buildings and people struggling. Then the curse of King Gudjo comes back to the surface. You no longer have to wonder why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's history. It's it's um stories, cowboy stories, or stories that I tell have to count. After the end, they have to scratch your conscience. They've got to make you smile. Mm -hmm. They've got to make you cry. Mm -hmm. In closing, in this book, there is a poem that Marsha asked me to do. Quite frankly, she should do it. She knows that she memorized it. <laughs> it's a, the poem is a, it's a simple poem. One of the simplest in here. It's called Dear Mama. Okay, before you do that, close the sound on that because I love that idea. I want to I want to tell you some observations that I okay. made in a, in this conversation. So, in in with interviewing artists, mm -hmm. I the 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 people who have had a long career or who have who have had a a personal feeling of success, mm -hmm. all do things that stretch themselves. Yes, and I I hear I've heard you tell. The Paul Sykes story. You know, you you push yourself. You get. You try something different. You try something new. Or, in the case of even the story about Wawoka, you're kind of pushing the envelope oh, a little bit. Yes. <laughs> you know, and but, and it's all it's all a challenge, but it makes you better at what you do. Your art becomes better because of the way you you push yourself, or you know whatever it is. Yeah, you're right. And um. So that's the first observation. The second one is um, yesterday I was we we had a lesson about some uh, famous women from Oklahoma, and um, one was Tayata Fisher, and so the state of Oklahoma declared her to be an Oklahoma national treasure in 1987 or something like that. And while I was listening to you, I was thinking. That Wallace Moore is a Oklahoma treasure. I'm a lot of treasure. <laughs> you are you are absolutely a treasure to have. I mean, you put in the hours, you put in the work, you yeah. do the research, and you you you're very diligent on all of the things that you do to to produce an a historically accurate poem or story, um, and and you've learned so much. I think I could just sit and talk to you for hours and just just should, glean the history from you. You should be married to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody beat me to it. <laughs> when I, um, if you ever pass me on the interstate, one of my shortcomings is I don't claim to be, I'm not crazy, but I don't claim to be entirely sane either. Um, <laughs> I like what I do well enough that I memorize um, some of the poems that are, and the stories that are, uh, that are closest and dearest to my heart. And on rare occasions, I have to drive to Oklahoma City to the doctor mm -hmm. or to, uh, to Cabela's. <laughs> you know, you gotta go to Cabela's. Yeah, gotta get your Western weird. Yeah, gotta get, yeah, gotta get your Western. <laughs> 
And I, I have serious radio, but I don't listen to it. Once I get past close to the first told them, the radio is turned off. There's nobody in the car but me and God. And I'll recite one of my own stories. Now you say, that's really, really vain. You need to pray about that. <laughs> well, yes, it is. But the, the problem is, I like what I've done and he's allowed me to do well enough that I'll do it again. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll repeat it again. You know, this book, I bet you I've, re I've read this book at least three times. And the real, the thing that you really need to pray about as far as being vain and arrogant is concerned is when you read it and you say, boy, did I write that? <laughs> Man, that sounds better than I thought it was going to. That is good. I wrote that, yeah. Let's yeah. check it. Since yes, that's yeah. your name. But um, it isn't something that... Um, it isn't something that I recommend you do if you if you plan to make a lot of money. You may well be, be uh, God may bless you. And you may be a little fortunate. Uh, I found that when I'm pushed, I resist and I don't and I don't enjoy it nearly as much. When in 2007, Marsh and I went to Disney to represent the state of Oklahoma, we were there for a week in Epcot Center, and I had to tell the same stories every day for five days. To a different audience, but the same story. Still, yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wallace yeah. Moore, and now it's time for Life and Times of the Buffalo Soldiers. And we started drumming. I got tired of it. Mm -hmm. After about three days, I didn't, I didn't want to do it anymore because yeah. it wasn't fun. What I do now, I can, it's fun. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we were in, uh, last year, we were in Muskogee at the Bass Reese Festival, did some stories there. Uh, uh, we, we came home, we, we toured the, uh, the battlefield, Honey Spring Battlefield. And I talked to my great great grandfather, whose ghost is alive and well there, because he was he was in that fight. Mm. Uh, I said, I, I see him coming across the marching <laughs> square. I'm sure, he's riding come this way. Um, and the thing that it helps, it helps to have an imagination, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one that is alive and well. Mm -hmm. And I'm praying. I just pray that I never lose my memory. Uh, my imagination because I'll always have uh, ability to entertain myself. Mm -hmm. so, and so. others. Yeah. And others. Yeah. Stories. Yeah. Well, um, I just hope that uh, that you write another book. Yeah. Oh, I right. mean, I feel like I feel like the okay. that's the only way we're gonna be able to hang on to the all of this information that you have. We've got several written. We've got several now. Uh, we've got one it's ready to go to print. We have, we have another porn book. Um, and um, if I can, I'm gonna. If you, is it now that you open, oh, you've opened that door. Oh boy, my next book is going to be called Samson, mm. and it's about uh, a boy who lives in the Everglades, of Florida, mm -hmm. and he has dramatically a generation he can't see. And so he said, well, How can someone? A sighted person, person who doesn't see very well at all, survive in a land full of things that bite you and sting you and kill you. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> God has blessed all of his other senses to develop. And I don't remember, she's probably not old enough to remember it, but you are. Remember the cartoon character, the comic book Daredevil? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, he's like Daredevil. Ah. He can, he, even though if he were here, he couldn't see, but he could tell how many people that were in this room. And he can smell you. Mm -hmm. And if you he threw can, something at him, he'd reach up yes, and catch yes, it. <laughs> yes, he can hear your heart beat. He, can, he doesn't know. He, 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 you know, there's a snake laying on the side of the trail. He knows the snake is there. He can't see it mm -hmm. because he can hear his heartbeat. Now, this is a boy that I place into the middle of the Seminole Wars. Mm. And um, I like with, with Forrest Gump. I let him bump shoulders with some of the mm -hmm. some of the right. historical people, right, yeah. with the general and the, the Indian chiefs, etc. And it's called Samson. And the reason it's called Samson is because his his father, his grandfather, was named Old Sam, and he is the son Sam. of Old Sam. So yeah. he's Sam's son. Oh, so I, that, that, that we're sounds. Gonna, we're going to do that next. Good. We've just been toying with it. I turned it in. I turned it in to to be looked at, and the critics came back, and everyone said we like it. You just need to give us more of it. And so I'm writing book two, the second half 
Hopefully, before the summer is out, we'll have it. Oh, that'll be good. Well, hopefully, you'll be here for some of our events that we're having well, throughout the year, too. We love yeah, it when you're back. here. Um, I wanted to say a couple, of, I think I need to correct myself. I said, a, I think I said Tayata was an Oklahoma national treasure. She was Oklahoma state treasure. <laughs> and Cabela's is not a Western wear store. It's a hunting store. <laughs> hunting clothes. Yes. I know that. Yes, well. Anyway, you want to close us out with that poem? Sure. Give me, oh dear mama. Whichever, I don't know. You didn't say the title of the one you were going to, is that, is that the one? Okay. I'm getting, the, I'm getting Where the one from you? Marcia. Okay. Well, we'll see. Um, <sighs> The, the book, this book here, there, oh, here it is, right? Dear Mama is on page 15. Can I provide this book? 13, 14, and 15 more. What happens is, <clears throat> most people like to think that they're Western heroes, especially soldiers regardless of the race, that got killed or died during the so-called Indian War period, <clears throat> died, you know, you know, from arrows, bullets, mm -hmm. running horses and dust. And that isn't true. We'd like, the storytellers would like, the movies, the movie producers would like it to be, most of them died from several things, dysentery, mm -hmm. um, snake bite got kicked by a horse and medicine was, med medicine was so uh, in its infancy that you couldn't, if you got infection, there was yeah. antibiotics. Yeah. So imagine, if you will, <clears throat> Fort Sill, the guardhouse is here. And uh, straight north of the guardhouse is Calvary Row. The duty officer mounts his horse, it's two o'clock in the morning, and he makes his rounds. His job is to make sure that the guards are on their post and the post is quiet. He rides, rides past the cavalry barracks and he expects as he rides past um, the cavalrymen, they're rascals. Sometimes they'll put blankets over the windows and they'll stay up late and gavel. And he's checking on this as he rides slowly past, but it's all black. At the end of the cavalry barracks, the road where the cavalry barracks are, is a hospital. And as he makes the corner, he looks over and he looks into the window, the hospital, and the light is on. And he wonders, what could the <clears> surgeon <throat> possibly be doing at this, this time of night? So mm -hmm. being the duty officer, being the man in charge of the post, he rides over slowly, gets off of his mount, and walks in. And when he walks into the building, there before him is a young Black man, about 19, 20 years old. He's lying on a straw blood-stained straw mattress, sweaty, looks like he's really sick, and sitting at his side, there is a white man, an officer. But the officer sitting at his side is not the surgeon, it's the chaplain. And as the duty officer stands there watching, the young black man says, dear mom, the chaplain is writing this year letter. Because as you know, Mama, I never learned to read or write. So I'm afraid I got a little bad news. You see, my old pony, he slipped and fell with me last night. Now, we weren't out chasing no outlaws or Indians. We was just on a little routine patrol. We crossed a little creek and started up the back on the far side. That's when my old bay went knee deep in some kind of a prairie dog hole. He lays there for a while and catches his breath. Finally he says, the chaplain's writing. And he says, now the surgeon, he done told me that I probably won't be around in the morning when the bugler blows his bugle at the start of the day. So if you would, Mama, put in a good word for me with the master tonight. And he walked away. He said, I don't ask them. They said, no. He said, I don't question that, so I'm being told 
Now I want to be brought home and be buried in, out back next to Grandma. Grandma. But don't worry about it. My spirit will be back in the Shenandoah Valley a long time before my old body gets cold. So please don't worry about me, Mom. Tell Papa not to worry. Neither of you should cry. I'm going to a better place. I just hope that when I get there, you and I follow will understand why I had to die. Now, when you read this letter, he says, I don't want you and Papa to, to cry, and, and I want you to, to hang on to him. And I want you to feel good about what I've done. You see, Mama, the good Lord has blessed me to ride with some mighty fine men. If I get to heaven, they've got a cavalry. You bet you I'll do the, the whole thing all over again. It's getting hard to talk now. So I would like to say a last few words because there's some things I want you and Papa to know in a few things. A few things I'd like to say and a few things I'd like you and Papa to know. First of all, we thank the chaplain for writing you this letter. But I think it's time now, Mama. It's time for your baby boy. We normally end that with, uh, she, she runs the, the music sometimes at the end point. They have taps, and as I say, to go, she starts taps, she plays, mm -hmm. she plays. That's a very emotional poem. Well, it works on, it works on the women in the audience, uh, the men don't, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you have a son, you have a child, yeah. you know, yeah. the, the idea is that we, in this case, with the Buffalo Soldiers, we're talking about young men, the station is full of silver, but good. 60, 70 percent of them never got a chance to go home again. Mm -hmm. There was no black community out here. Yeah. There was uh, they all they only had was each other. Uh, there was no way for them was there was no way for them to get back to the east, south, where they originally lived. So when he left, he saw his mama for the last time. Yeah. And since he was illiterate, and a good 85, 90 percent of them were illiterate, they didn't even people like the chaplain or the lodges or somebody to write a letter for them because they had no way of communicating. And the letter would take maybe a month if it got to the hall. Uh, to get back to, say, Tennessee or St. Louis or where we came from. So you literally cut off from your family. Wow. That's, that, was, that was really good. Ah, Liz, thank you so much. Well, thank you for, for coming me. on Trail Talk today. Yes. That's, I, I honestly, I think we could get together and talk again and talk more about your books <laughs> or something. I really I was, think we I was we warned could. when I left home and said, now listen, keep it. You're going to get started and I'm going to be able to shut you up. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's been really fun. Thanks for coming, Mr. Moore. I appreciate it. Yeah. Now, listen, when we sign off, we say happy trails. You ready? Yes. All right. Let's look at the camera. We'll see you guys next week. Happy trails. Happy trails. Happy trails.